This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, I want to thank the students for inviting me. It's always really an honor to be invited by the students. You never quite know why they picked you, but this is really great. <laughs> so, okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about responses to DNA damage. And responses to a, an acute dose of heavy DNA damage can go on for weeks. But what we're mostly going to focus on are these immediate responses that happen in the very same day as being hit by this acute dose. And these things have to do with, well, this is tricky. These, these kind of responses are really responses to the damage that we're inducing. Downstream things have more to do with responses to the responses. You know, some cells have died, things have to be replenished. And I'll talk about that very briefly because my talk is probably too long already. Okay, so our model DNA damaging agent, which we're going to use throughout this talk, are gamma rays. Just to make it clear what gamma rays do, the rays themselves do not probably induce many double-strand breaks. So these are photons, they zip right through the cell. The great majority of them are not even going to interact with any of the matter in the cell. They're just going to go right through. But if one is lucky, it might interact probably with a water molecule, because that's the most common molecule in the cell. It's going to spit out through Compton scattering a very high energy electron. That electron can travel quite far in the cell, and if it happens to come to a stop within the cell, it'll depend, deposit all of that energy in a little burst of reactive oxygen species. So this is really quite an indirect effect, but it's making several different types of damage right here. And again, most of the damage will be to water because most of the cellular components are water. But if that little burst happens to lodge in the nucleus, it has a good chance of hitting the DNA. And the burst itself happens within a certain a radius, which just by chance is about the same as the radius of the DNA. So you'll get multiple damage to both sides of the DNA. And that means you don't have a good template strand for repair. It's possible you could introduce a break in the backbone to begin with, but also repair activities will introduce double strand breaks. And this may take time for those breaks to be induced. So things are going to happen gradually. So again, the burst could have been over here and you get single-sided damage. Or if the burst happened to be right where a DNA molecule was, you'll get a double-strand break eventually. All right, now double-strand breaks sound horrific, but they actually have very little biological significance, provided the cell doesn't divide. So the only point of having genes be connected to a chromosome is if you're going to do cell division again. So the whole point of being on a chromosome is to be attached to a centromere. If the cell doesn't need to divide, the DNA can still replicate. It can still do transcription. There's no problem. There are many origins of replication. Um, and everything can be just fine. It's only in the context of cell division that you'd end up losing a chromosome arm because there's no centromere here. And here in yeast, you would end up with a dead daughter cell because you've lost a chromosome arm, it's going to carry something that's essential on there. So that's really bad news. But as long as cell division doesn't happen, double strand breaks are not a problem. All right. So the immediate DNA damage response, the stuff that happens in the same day as the DNA damage, is to have some sort of system for monitoring the presence of damage. And that system has to talk to the cell and give it some good ideas, like arresting progression of the cell cycle until that signal disappears, maybe inducing repair if that's something that needs to happen. Both bacteria and eukaryotes are extremely exquisitely sensitive to the presence of double strand breaks. And in yeast, a single double strand breaks in a completely unnecessary plasmid will prevent cell cycle progression. Now, yeast and other single-celled single organisms if they detect the presence of a break for several days and it's clear that it's never going to go away, since they're a single-celled <coughs> organism, they might as well give it a shot. Go on with replication, maybe <coughs> they'll find they didn't need that chromosome arm after all in their daughter cell. Right, but um, in an animal, that's a risky thing to do. We carry a, a huge genetic load on our chromosomes. If we go from being heterozygous for a mutation on one of those arms to uncovering that recessive mutation, it can easily lead to cancer. We have trillions of cells, so in our case, rather than adapt to the presence of double strand breaks, the cell would decide to die or permanently arrest instead so that it never undergoes um, 
DNA, sorry, cell division and exposes that, head, uh, that um, deleterious allele. So the question we're asking here is what about plants? Do plants have the exact same issue as single-celled organisms or animals or are they somewhere in between? All right, so let's think about it. Do we expect plants to have programmed cell cycle responses to DNA damage at all? Of course we do, because it's a very sensitive, sensible thing to do. But let's just play devil's advocate for a second here. Plants are diploid and often polyploid, and they tolerate aneuploidy well. They have backup copies of things. In my case, I'm working with Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is a self-pollinating organism, so it's homozygous for all loci, so it's not going to be exposing heterozygosity by losing a chromosome arm because it's already totally inbred. Plant cells can't move, so cancers can't metastasize. So even if you messed up the regulation of the cell cycle in a single cell, you might end up with a tumor on a plant, but you'd rather, you'd probably not end up with death. And again, in the case of Arabidopsis, we have a 10-week life cycle anyway, really doesn't matter. Plant development is extremely flexible. So if some cells are messed up and starting to take off on their own, and there aren't many examples of them ever doing this. You know, you know viruses or bacteria can reprogram cells that cells rarely ignore the signals from other cells. So this is an example of the flexibility of plant um, growth in that you can take a fig tree in this case, a ficus, and you can turn it into boards and you can pound them into the ground and staple barbed wire to them. And if there's any living tissue still in the board, it'll make another tree, right? So animals don't do this, but plants can easily do this sort of thing. So they can work around a lot of problems. Now, Still, why not do cell cycle arrest? Well, the reason not to is plants compete for resources only through growth. Animals don't do that. They can run around and compete for resources. The plant, if these plants, two little seedlings are growing next to each other and they're competing for light, if one gets bigger than the other, even transiently, it'll overshadow the other and have an exponential advantage that will never stop. It's a little like uncontrolled capitalism. Right? If you don't have government regulations in place, as soon as one person gets rich, he can dominate all the others. Right? So in this case, sorry, yeah, plants have to worry about growth rate versus genetic purity, you know, which is really a more important issue. So it, this immediately leads us to think about somatic versus germline cells. Maybe it's okay to grow like mad and ignore genome fidelity as long as you're outpacing your competitors. But the germline, perhaps, is something you don't want that to happen in. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about the germline in this talk at all, because it's harder to look at than the root tip. So instead, I'll talk a little bit about meristematic versus terminally differentiated cells and how their responses might be different. All right, so do double strand breaks occur at all in nature? There's no natural source of radiation that plants really have to worry about. And the kind of doses I'm using are enormous. You're, even if you were growing plants in Chernobyl, where they grow just fine, they wouldn't get this sort of dose. All right, so double-strand breaks are generated during re DNA replication quite frequently. So these are single-ended double-strand breaks due to breakage of a replication fork. So larger genomes will have bigger problems with this sort of issue. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you have a replication fork and there's maybe a single-sided, you know, a lesion on just one base. DNA polymerase is very fastidious and it doesn't want to replicate f past that. It's going to leave single-stranded DNA on both of these sides and that is a very fragile thing. And so it's quite likely for one of these branches to break off, right? This is essentially in a complete chromosome, that's fine. But this is a chromosome that has a break and nothing to rejoin it to. So that's a single-ended break. So every round of replication, this probably happens in every cell. Right? In Arabidopsis, the genome size is 1 30th the size of maize, so I would think it would happen 30 times more often in maize than in Arabidopsis. Double strand breaks can also be generated naturally during desiccation and rehydration. And I don't mean drought, I mean desiccation. When biological tissues reach you know, air levels of humidity. They're just left out to dry out. And animals, most animals, cannot withstand desiccation. But some fungi can and plants can. Seed plants do it every generation in the seeds. 
sometimes pollen is desiccation tolerant and some kinds of pollen are not. So this is another example of where double strand breaks could be generated substantially in the genome. And of course, bigger genomes, just because they have more DNA, have a greater probability of getting a double strand break. Right. And is this damage acute? So we're, throughout this talk, going to be talking about acute damage where I slam the plant with gamma radiation, then I look at its recovery, rather than leaving it to grow on something that induces double strand breaks. Is damage to seeds acute? It depends whether you believe that seeds, in their desiccated cryptobiotic state, are actually still to be metabolically active in repairing things. But there is an older literature about the fact that seeds, if you watch them germinate, they will undergo what's called unscheduled DNA replication, which means that all of the cells are doing a little repair here and there. And once that period is done, then the seed will actually proceed with cell division. And it won't do that. So it seems to be cleaning up its genome at the beginning of, of germination after it's imbibed and then it goes on with its life. So it's a little like suffering an acute dose of DNA damage. It suddenly awakens to the fact that it has accumulated DNA damage. <clears throat> All right, our model system is the Arabidopsis seedling. It has highly stereotypical development. We know what all the cells are doing pretty well. It has lots of visually visualized cell types and has a variety of cell cycle modes. So if we look at this young Arabidopsis seedling, the different cells are doing different things. And this is a plant audience mostly, so I could go through this pretty quickly. There's an apical meristem here and an apical meristem down here, and both of these regions are rapidly dividing, and there's sort of a stem cell niche that's creating all these new cells. <coughs> Those are mitotic cells. Now, unlike animals, there's also a lot of endoreduplication. So all of the growth of the hypocotyl after germination is through expansion of cells, not cell division, and so those are becoming endoreduplicated undergoing S phase but not M phase, and the cells are getting bigger and bigger. Same thing in the zone of elongation in the root. After they're done being mitotic, the cells will start to expand and increase the copy number of the DNA without undergoing cell division. And then there's differentiation, um, sort of after that expansion is done. So we are looking at all kinds of different cell cycles. When we irradiate these seedlings, every single cell is getting the exact same dose of breaks, right? The radiation, as I said, goes right through. There's no higher dose to outside cells than inside cells. Everything's getting the same dose. But the cells have different destinies, and so they might have different responses to DNA damage. All right, do plants exhibit program responses to DNA damage? And of course, yes, I wouldn't be talking here. And um, how, first, the questions, more intellectual questions to ask are, how do you know a response is programmed? rather than just a toxic effect. Uh, for instance, if you, if you expose a plant to drought, you might see it wilt. You might think, poor plant, it's suffering from drought, but it is, in a way, undergoing a programmed response to that drought. It's dropping its leaves so it's not picking up as much sun as it used to. It's doing this intentionally. So we're trying to di distinguish between intentional responses, which we call programmed, and toxic, inevitable effects of ionizing radiation. Then for the programmed responses, we'd like to know how they're regulated, and we want to know what their biological significance is, too. All right, so most cases we will be irradiating seedlings, but sometimes we irradiate seeds. So this is the mature embryo of Arabidopsis inside of its seed. It has two cotyledons. It has a root, but it has no true leaves, no visible true leaves at all. There's a meristem that will divide to give true leaves. So if you irradiate at this stage, for wild type seeds, when we look a couple weeks later, we have plenty of true leaves. You can spot them with their leaf hairs. 100 grays, basically no effect on growth. This is a dose that is about 30 times the dose that would kill a person. Um, but the genome size is 1 30th that of a human genome size. Right? But this is, you know, clearly it's not a lethal dose at all. It has no effect on growth if irradiated as seeds. Now, if we take that up to 500 grays, which is about 150 double strand breaks per diploid G1 genome, we actually see miniaturization of everything, the cotyledons, everything that was in the embryo is alive, it's gravitropic, it's phototropic, um, but it's not growing, and the cells are miniaturized, they're not, not expanding. So is that a toxic effect or a programmed effect? I can't tell you. 
Another thing we can look at that's an effect of ionizing radiation is mutagenesis. So we have this assay for mutagenesis where you have a phosphor-resistant knockout of an allele that calls, causes albinism. So we can select for heterozygotes. They have to be green and they have to be phosphor-resistant. And then we can irradiate those seeds and ask what the rate of sectoring is. And the rate of sectoring, if you don't irradiate the, the seeds, is zero. You can't look at enough to, to find those sectors. But if you irradiate them, you can produce these sectors that reflect chromosome loss, breakage, I don't know what. It's a very large, broad net that catches all mutations at this locus. And it maxes out at about 4% of plants because the plants get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you can't look at sectors anymore as part of their program DNA damage response. But that sectoring mutagenesis itself, it's hard to believe that's a programmed response. That is a toxic effect of ionizing radiation. Now you think cell death would also be a toxic effect of ionizing radiation, but the reason you die from five grays of radiation is not because your epithelial intestinal lining is especially sensitive to ionizing radiation. It's because it's a sensitive to the response to destroy itself in response to ionizing radiation. So you slough off your epi all your epidermal cells. Similarly, here if we look at plants, we irradiate the whole root tip, everybody gets the same dose, but we get death. Not entirely, just, you know, I can see a dead cell here. PI staining indicates that the cells can no longer pump out PI, and so they, they start to glow. And you might say, well, maybe this is a highly mitotic population. That makes it more sensitive because it's running through the cell cycle faster. But if we look at the mitotic population using cyclin B11 GFP as a marker, we see that this whole mass of cells here is highly mitotic, and um, they're not all dying. It's instead focused on the stem cells for the steel of the root here, all right, which suggests that it's a programmed response rather than a toxic response. Another thing that cells um, root tips do in response to radiation is here's a root tip growing, four days old, eight days old. Here's a root cap. You can't see any root hairs because they're farther up the root. If you hit them with ionizing radiation, four days later you can start to see root hairs as differentiation approaches the root tip. The root tip has stopped dividing and stopped growing away from the differentiating zone. It's coming down. At eight days, all the cells have become really massive and huge. The entire root tip has swollen up. There are root hairs everywhere because there's no cell division in the root tip is not growing away from this differentiation zone. Right. So we, you could say that this is premature endoreduplication and differentiation, or you could say it's just waiting for differentiation to catch up with it. Um, another cute phenotype is this. If we look at this DNA repair mutant, XPF, that's defective in a flap endonuclease, we irradiate these plants as seeds Wild type is not sensitive to this dose. The DNA repair mutant is. These cotyledons are still undergoing cell division. There's not a lot of cell division in a cotyledon naturally, but there's a, um, there's a formation of stomata, for example, that's all post-embryonic, and that's still occurring. Those cell divisions are still occurring. But these cell divisions to make leaves are not. And so, again, that suggests it's a programmed response some cells are undergoing arrest or death, other cells are not. Okay, so how do we know which responses are due to DNA damage? Because ionizing ra uh, radiation affects everything in the cell. And how do we know which responses are programmed versus direct effects? Well, to look at the responsibility of DNA damage, we can't quite do that directly, but we can do a fairly convincing experiment where what we do is look at mutants that are defective in end-to-end, non-homologous end joining of double-strand breaks. So in a G1 cell, this is what's doing the bulk of the DNA repair. The ends are simply re-ligated together. It's a reasonably error-free process so long as the ends haven't been resected. There is also um, this gene which I mentioned before, XPF, which is a flap endonuclease and is sometimes required for some types of non-homologous end joining. All right, so we can look at these and we can ask, if you're defective in double-strand break repair, do you mimic the effects of ionizing radiation at a lower dose? And you know in the mutant that any phenotype you see is due to this deficiency. 
and therefore due to double strand breaks. So for example, if we look at a DNA ligase 4 mutant, at zero grays of radiation, it's wild type. At 100 grays of radiation, when irradiated as seeds, it makes this miniaturized, tiny cotyledon, little seedling that's not going to grow again. And this mimics the effects of 500 grays of radiation. All right. Similarly, at only 20 grays of radiation, before we looked at 100, wild type is very slow to induce any cell death in the root tip. It's not particularly focused there either. But if we look at DNA ligase 4 at 20 grays, we can see within four hours there starts to be cell death. So this is also apparently a response to double strand breaks. Doesn't mean it's programmed, but it's a response to double strand breaks. And interestingly, different kinds of persisting DNA damage can induce different effects on growth. So I just talked about XPF, having this lovely phenotype that we call the gamma plantlet, in which everything is normal, you know, hypocotyl development is normal, cotyledon development is normal, but you're just not getting true leaves as opposed to DNA ligase 4 at the same dose, which has this highly miniaturized seedling. There's no dose of gamma radiation where we can get lag 4 to look like this. Right? So it's not just a matter of degree. Right? By the time the cotyledons look this good, we have true leaves also. Right? So this is a response to something that's a very potent signal for telling these cells to not divide. Whereas this is a response to something that's making all cells miniaturized and inhibiting growth. Right, and again, this differential sensitivity of these cells versus these cells, again, these still have cell division, they're still performing a stomata, suggests that this is a programmed response. All right, so we felt so strongly that this was a programmed response that Sasha Proust was willing to undergo a genetic screen to look for regulators of this. So if it's a programmed response, there must be something that's telling the cell, here's a break, this is what you should do in response to it, or whatever it is that XPF is repairing. Right, so he took the XPF line, and he mutagenized seeds with EMS, and he treated them actually with 100 grays, and then he looked for plants that could grow in spite of the fact that they'd been irradiated. So he's looking for true leaf production. And he found several mutants, and one of them was SOG1. You can see the leaves are not great, but the phyllotoxy is normal, and the, pr the time at which they're produced is normal. So the leaves are struggling, but they're still emerging. Right? So they've lost the ability to uh, induce probably a checkpoint in the apical meristem. And SOG1, as Tomo discovered, is also defective in this program's cell death. So if we look at SOG1, at 0, 04 and 8 hours after irradiation, SOG1 has no cell death. It's not sensitive to ionizing radiation. In a way, it's resistant. Again, because this is a programmed response, and SOG1 tells you it's a programmed response, uh, this is not happening. It's not a toxic effect. It's something the cells are doing intentionally. And just as to be entirely forthcoming with you, if we go to the next day and we look at SOG1 mutants, we do see cell death. So here's wild type 24 hours. You see this focused cell death. Here's SOG. You see this checkerboard cell death instead. It hasn't got the focus. And same thing, we go to 48 hours, we see continuing cell death. So this is SOG1 independent cell death. I don't know if it's programmed or not. Right? This is clearly programmed, the stuff at the earlier time points. All right, so if losing SOG1 is so great for the plant because it doesn't have cell death, and it can go on and divide in spite of radiation, what is SOG1 for? Well, it's the same thing any checkpoint protein is for. It's to prevent um, the accumulation of mutations. So if we irradiate seeds, again with that albino pale green marker, and we look for sectors, here's wild type, XPF, XPF plus SOG, and just SOG by itself. So this is suggesting that SOG1 is really important for minimizing heritable DNA damage induced by ionizing radiation. So it can control chromosomal stability. It does this by inhibiting progression of the cell cycle. I haven't showed you all this data. It switches cells from a mitotic to endoreduplicative cell cycle. So again, as long as you are not doing cell division, double strand breaks are not a problem. And it induces cell death in dividing meristematic cells. 
Right. So the isolation of mutants defective in these responses indicates that they're programmed responses rather than toxic effects of radiation. <coughs> All right, so Karu Yoshiyama was a postdoc in the lab, and she mapped SOG and figured out what gene it was, and it turned out to be a transcription factor, a NAC domain family protein. It has a um, single amino acid change from a glycine that's entirely conserved in all 100 NAC domain proteins in Arabidopsis to an arginine. Right. And it looks like, um, unfortunately, you know, we would love to be able to go to NIH and say we're going to look for SOG mutants in humans or something, but this NAC domain family does not exist outside of the plant world. In fact, it only exists in land plants. And if I want to really go out on a limb, I could say that you couldn't become a land plant without SOG because it's important for response to desiccation. But that's really pushing it. Okay. Anyway, you can find homologs of SOG as opposed to other NAC domain proteins in related angiosperms. So they have more closely related genes to SOG than to the next NAC domain protein in Arabidopsis. So they probably are all carrying this response, but it hasn't been shown at all. Now, SOG itself is not transcriptionally induced by ionizing radiation. It's always present. And that makes sense for the master regulator. It's going to be at the top of the chain. It has to be present to detect the DNA damage. So how does it do that? Well, damage sensors are conserved among eukaryotes. And there are two classes. And sometimes they trade off some functions. But you can distinguish between them pretty well. There's ATM, uh, which detects double-strand breaks directly with the help of other factors. And there's ATR, which slightly indirectly detects persisting single-stranded stretches of DNA. Not single-strand breaks, but single-stranded DNAs. It uses these factors to do that. Both of these um, sort of touch the lesion before becoming activated. Then this is in mammals. There's a check one and check two kinases. These don't exist in plants at all. So plants have the detectors don't necessarily have the same connections. But when you get down to the regulation of the cell cycle itself, of course, they do share some factors. And we one is one of those. <coughs> all right, so for instance, this gamma plantlet formation, which these are all irradiated seeds. Here's wild type. It's resistant to radiation. Here's XPF making a lovely gamma plantlet. Here's XPF SOG making these sort of crappy looking true leaves. If we look at ATM, ATM still has the arrest. So ATM is not required for that arrest. If we look at ATR mutant, we get the true leaves back again. And they look a lot better than SOG, too. So ATR is apparently detecting whatever lesion it is that XPF is leaving behind in the cell. ATM is not required for that. ATR is absolutely required. And in fact, we one is also required for the detection. So this is probably some kind of replication block and we want as part of that pathway corresponding to that. OK, so SOG1 is a transcription factor. So does Arabidopsis have a transcriptional response to ionizing radiation? So with this experiment is to take five-day-old seedlings, irradiate not seeds, but seedlings, um, with 100 grays, which is a dose that slows them down a little, but then they all can recover from that dose, and look at the entire transcriptome 1.5, 3, 6, 12, 24 hours, which is presented on a timeline across here. And the red bars are genes that are repressed. And green bars are genes that are, um, I'm sorry, red is induced and green is repressed. And this has been sorted by the computer into similar expression patterns. So there are hundreds of genes that are induced and peak between about 1 and 3 hours right here. There are also hundreds of genes that are su suppressed, and that maximum suppression is about at nine, nope, sorry, six hours, six hours. And these include transcripts that promote cell cycle progression. And then there's this little cluster of genes that are induced at 12 hours also. All right, so is this a response to double serum breaks, or is this a response to damage to other cellular components? It could be both. If we look at the list of genes that are induced, the most highly induced genes, and these are all on AFI chips. And the fold induction for genes like BRCA1, which are extremely repressed under normal conditions in the cell, is highly variable when you do the experiment, depending on 
how you process the data from the chips and where you draw the line about background levels of expression. So I don't know that this is really induced 581 fold. And it's certainly not two to the 581. We're just talking about 581 fold. All right, so if you look at this, you can see wild type is inducing these genes to these degrees. And if you look at the list of genes and you happen to know anything about um, DNA metabolism, you can see that they're all DNA metabolism genes. All right, ATR mutation has no effect on the induction of those genes. ATM is critical for the induction of these genes. So at this time point, in response to gamma radiation, ATM is driving the induction of this cluster, this little red cluster of genes. Okay. All right, so if we then go ahead and expose the ATM mutant, you can see that a lot of this response is still going on, but not this cluster. So ATM, that's the double-strand break response, because ATM is a double-strand break detector. You can see that we're still getting repression of the cell cycle, and that's because if we look at gene-by-gene gene basis, ATM and ATR both play semi-redundant roles in that response. So this is ATR-driven in an ATM background. Okay, so what about SOG? SOG's a transcription factor. What does it regulate in this response? And what Kauru found is that it regulates everything. So for this little cluster, again, of genes, SOG1 is essential for its induction. So um, SOG1 must be a transcription factor that doesn't bind to every one of these promoters, but perhaps binds to the promoters of transcription factors that then bind to the promoter of these. So SOG1 is remarkably important for this response. All right, and how does SOG1 work? Um, Kaoru had a paper published recently. She went on to work on this. SOG1 had, um, we knew that it had a SQ motif, a couple of them that were highly predicted to be regulated by both ATM and ATR. So what a, our model is, is ATM is induced by a double strand break. It becomes an active kinase and it activates the activity of pre-existing SOG1 proteins. And this goes on to induce other effects too. Okay, and um, again, if you're interested, you can see Kelly's paper here. All right, so we talked a little bit before about what relevance does ionizing radiation have for plant biology at all? Because obviously plants have a lovely programmed response to it, but it's never encountered in nature. So something that DNA repair people like to say in the literature is, for instance, any conventional stress induces reactive oxygen species, and that induces DNA damage, and this is probably important for response to stress. But if you actually use this stress, this DNA damage response as an indicator for the presence of double strand breaks, we could say, if we look at other stresses, do we see the induction of this response at all? So again, here's with gamma. This is another kind of ionizing radi radiation, HCE. This is in the ATM mutant. And this is a particularly nice diagnostic cluster of transcripts that are ATM-dependent induced. So if we unmask all this and look at some other stresses, salt, osmotic, drought, cold, heat, blah, 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 we are not seeing these clusters of genes. So again, we've clustered expression based just on gamma. And then we've extended that analysis to look at other stresses. And we see a nice block here. This is genotoxic stress. It's a combination of MMS and mitomycin C. So again, it's just a DNA repair experiment. Hydroxyurea is an inhibitor of DNA replication. And we can see a little there. But if we look at these more generic stresses, you know, if you squint, you can see it in salt, and that's the roots as opposed to the shoots. And this is UVB, you can see it a little there. But that's about it. All right, so if we look at the GO category, and we've already discussed this a little, of these ATM-dependent gamma-induced genes, it's, it's massively overrepresented for RNA and DNA metabolism. And if we, again, look through all these stresses and just take the RNA and DNA metabolism genes that we really understand and look really hard for their induction by generic stress, we don't see it. Right, so this response is not there to deal with generic stresses. It may be there to deal with um, seed storage. 
Okay, so this is just what I told you here. Um, surprisingly, it's not even induced by Paraquat, which is specifically a Ross inducer. So what's different between Paraquat and ionizing radiation? Again, ionizing radiation is producing clusters of ROS. The, the amount of energy deposited in a very small er area is very high, and you damage both strands. Normal ROS just doesn't do that. It damages single bases, happens all the time in plants, and they're very, very good at coping, using excision repair to repair singly damaged bases. Okay, so desiccation tolerance and radiation tolerance seem to be two sides of the same coin. So this is a famous organism that's extremely radiation resistant. And it was found that it's also extremely desiccation resistant. Mutants that are sensitive to IR are also sensitive to dehydration. If you do the transcriptomics, the two stresses induce the same thing. And um, dehydration indeed induces massive amounts of breaks. And it's not just dehydration, it's dehydration, rehydration, cycling. And um, Chris West and Wanda Waterworth have done some research on this, and they have shown that as the plant, as the Arabidopsis seed is germinating, there's a one or two hour window during imbibition at which you see the induction of this response, and then it goes away again. But you have to really take thin slices of time to see that. So, and they've also shown DNA lag is four is important for seed longevity. So that probably is what this really elaborate response is all about. Okay, so to summarize so far, <laughs> and I'm not going to get all the way through this talk for sure. Um, the, we're looking at the immediate actual response to double strand breaks. And Arabidopsis has a robust, very reproducible transcriptional response to IR, which is governed by ATM and SOC1. And transcriptional response to IR is important in mammals and fungi. P53 is a transcription factor, but it is nowhere near this amplitude or this reproducibility. All right, the transcription scramps that's induced early after IR are DSB specific. And um, you can see uh, that Arabidopsis induces a program cell death response that is also ATM and SOG1 dependent to both UV, which I didn't discuss, and ionizing radiation. And this is focused largely in the precursor cells of the steel. All right, so we know that different cells respond in different ways <coughs> to gamma radiation. And so we can ask, is the short-term transcriptional response different in different cells? So this requires the presence of SOG1. SOG1 is a transcription factor. We can cross our fingers and hope that these cells have a different transcriptional response than these cells around them. And if we could do the transcriptomics of just these cells, um, it might give us a clue as to some of the connecting dots between the double strand breaks and the induction of cell death. All right, so just as an example of the cell type specificity of DNA damage response, Phil made this construct of a BRCA1 promoter fused to luciferase. And what he's going to do is going to take the same plate here, <coughs> he's going to collect 20 minute batches of photons for nine hours after radiation. So again, this is the exact same plate, and here are these plants growing. You can see the true leaves, the cotyledons are dimmer. This is at one hour, and here's the root tip. And when you watch this, and we'll cycle through it several times, you might check out the root tip first, and then you can look farther up to see what's going on next time around. So here it goes. We're at three hours, and this flare has come up, and now it's starting to disappear. Here's something particularly beautiful. You see these evenly spaced spots of BRCA1 induction. So we're coming around again. If we look higher up, we can see the root tips of the lateral roots lighting up later than the root tip down here. And one more time, we can also see, at this time point, evenly spaced white spots within the root, which are probably the areas where the lateral roots are going to come out and emerge later. It's not clear to me that those cells are dividing already, but they know that they're meristem already. Okay, so in the case of BRCA1, we, we can clearly see that timing is different for different cell types, and some cells never express BRCA1, and um, some cells express it more strongly. There's lots in the highly mitotic new leaves. There's less in the already developed cotyledons. So in the case of BRCA1, we'll probably see induction only in cells that undergo 
or can undergo or are undergoing DNA replication because BRCA1 is involved in homologous repair of double strand breaks, and that occurs during S phase in G2 because it uses the sister chromatid as a template to repair the DNA. So the process, at least in mammals, is, is very cell cycle regulated and it's absolutely suppressed in G1. <coughs> so Phil went on to ask, does the quality of the transcriptional response vary with cell type? So this was all about quantity and timing for one cell. So we're going to go ahead and do the transcriptomics for a particular cell type. And <coughs> cell type specific transcriptomics can tell us lots of things. They help us identify first transcripts that we would never have seen on a whole ground up seedling because they're only being induced say in four cells that you're interested in. You're gonna have to do a lot of work to isolate those four cells and look at them and then, but the, suddenly that signal will stand out and you wouldn't have seen it before. Now, cell, Phil's not looking at just four cells. He's looking at a whole batch of cells that turned out to be about 5% of the total cells of the root tips that he's looking at. You can identify candidate genes for regulators of the effectors of cell type specific processes. And that's the gold that we're really looking for in this kind of experiment is to identify new regulators. And you know, just looking at go analysis can provide clues as to what's going on. Okay, so again, we're going to attempt to isolate these cells. We can't do this perfectly, but what we're going to use is a P wooden leg DFP fusion that labels these, really the dividing steel cells, the ones that are still undergoing replication. So the timing, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't do a lot of time points, just one. Phil chose something between four hours at which he could see no cell death and six hours at which he could after radiation. And his protocol is this. So we're taking the GFP positive line. We're cutting off just the root tips and throwing away the top of the plant. Then we're going to protoplast the root tips. We're gonna cell sort away the GFP plus and collect this population. It's about 5% of this population. Now Phil did not sort away what we're drawing here is red versus green. He just took the entire thing. So we're comparing GFP plus to the entire. Right, and just to show that the sort worked, short root is the transcript that should only be expressed in this population. And you can see that it's enhanced for expression of short root, whereas um, actin is expressed throughout. And you can see that if you take the entire root tip versus a GFP plus positive, these are pretty much the same, but short root is enriched here. So the sort worked. And just to go through this really quickly, this is, he's doing his RNA-seq analysis. Most of this is gibberish to me, but I trust my people in my lab. If we do the go analysis of these genes that are induced in both tissues equally, what we see is this gamma response that we discussed before, the, res we, the response to double strand breaks. So this is happening in the outer shell and in the inner core of the root tip. Both of them are responding to double strand breaks. This is just telling you the same thing. Repressed in both tissues is the cell cycle. So all these things about building new cells is being shut down temporarily while the root tip is responding to the sun degrees of radiation. If we look at genes that are induced more strongly in the GFP plus, which is really what we're looking for, that's why we're doing the experiment. And you look at these GO categories, and again, these GO categories are, are somewhat redundant, and the same genes may be falling into multiple GO categories. These all have to do with immune response. So as plant biologists, I'm sure you're sensitive with a hypersensitive response to pathogens. And this is suggesting that there are commonalities between the two. Probably the detection is different, but it may be that the cell death itself is similar. And the connection somewhere, those two processes meet up into the same signal transduction chain, perhaps. So we're seeing a similar effect, <coughs> again, induced specifically in the population that's going to die. And this is just showing you the relative fold induction in GFP plus versus the entire root tip here. And um, Phil took a couple of these genes, made GFP fusions, <coughs> transformed them into plants, and he can get some very pretty pictures without ionizing radiation. This is a senescence-associated gene, 14. This is with, if you look carefully and you know your root tip morphology, you see that this is not part of the steel. 
Right, so even though we're purifying cells in the steel, this is also induced outside of the steel. But it is induced right here in the root tip, and it's very IR inducible. And there's lots of expression within the steel going up too. All right, so the, we told you that the cell type specific transcriptomics can identify transcripts from selected cell types whose signals are normally swamped. And that's another interesting result that Phil got. There is a gene called ERF115, which is very hard to detect because it's very, very poorly expressed. And he sees it as being induced in his GFP plus population by IR. And what is the function of this gene? Levin de Velder's lab had this paper in Science 2013. ERF115, if it's overexpressed, causes the cells in the um, QC, you know, the sort of organizing core of the root tip, to divide. So it stimulates division of the QC. So it's interesting that at a time in which cell division is being actively repressed in the root tip, this stimulating gene that's specific for the QC is being induced. And Phil and I are still arguing about this, but I believe we're also seeing induction of WOX5, which is another QC-specific transcript right, that suppresses division of cells in the QC. So I think what we're seeing is induction of QC identity in tissues where it shouldn't be present. Okay, so the other thing we promised you was that we could identify candidate genes for regulators or effectors of cell cycle specific pro um, processes. And this is where our story gets a little bit sad because we're just starting to look at this, but I don't know. So Phil took 15 different homozygous exonic insertion lines representing 10 of these iron induced transcripts and none of them were mutant for PCD, program cell death. And he took seven exonic insertion lines representing seven repressed transcript, and none of them were mutant for PCD. And then he just got a little desperate, and he took 11 genes that govern, already known to govern hypersensitive response, and none of them were mutant for PCD either. So, you know, we need to look more carefully at this, but no one's particularly motivated to because this is this rather depressing result in the beginning. So the conclusions for part two, and I don't think I can go on to part three, but I do want to show you just one picture. Roots can recover from massive doses of IR. Um, oh, this is an early result, so I haven't, I haven't discussed this yet. The transcriptional response is required. No, uh, this is all later. So I'm going to go into this, um, talking about day one a little bit. So this is things that happen after day one. So the root tip undergoes cell death in this programmed way. At later time points, it spreads up. The root is going to have to recover, because it will, at this dose, recover and go on with growth. Um, as plant biologists, you're familiar with the QC, which is a population of about four cells that basically provide identity to this. But as a DNA repair and recovery person, I have always thought of the QC as a population of cells that is intentionally never dividing so that it never has problems with DNA damage. It's not undergoing replication, making replication errors. It's not cycling, so it's not so sensitive to double serum breaks. And it's there to replace these cells, which are foolish enough to be dividing. Right. So, so that's a great reason to have a quiescent center. But what I'm seeing when I look at the expression of QC identity after radiation makes me think that perhaps this is incorrect. So just to move on with this. OK. If we look at a wild type plant, we give it 150 grays of radiation, we watch the root growth over the days, there's still growth during the period after irradiation because most of the growth is elongation. You don't need to put supply new cells. You run out of new cells. By then, the meristem starts growing again, and you get root growth again. If you look at a SOG mutant at this dose, the SOG mutant actually stops growing and doesn't recover. So SOG is doing something that's important for recovery of the root tip. But 24 hours after 150 grays, you can see that um, wild type has experienced a fair amount of cell death. At this particular dose, this particular experiment, we can still see the QC in these root tips not getting cell death. And this is the complemented line, just a control to show you that's really a SOG1 dependent effect. 
If we look three days after 150 gray, we're starting to get elongation of these cells as the differentiation zone proceeds down towards the root tip. We can no longer see the QC in wild type. So this structure is getting messed up. It still looks nice and organized in SOG. And if you put them on constitutive rather than acute DNA damaging agent, SOG looks lovely compared with wild type. So it maintains its root shape. And again, this complemented line of QC is gone. We can't see it. <coughs> if we look five days after, you can still see the QC in SOG. We only see a mess in these root tips. And then seven days after, the situation changes. The root tip has recovered in wild type. It's reestablished and has grown away from all that big fat cell crap. The root tip is now growing again. <coughs> Same thing here. And differentiation has proceeded all the way down to the tip in SOG, and it's not going to be a meristem anymore. All right, so if you look at the growth day after day, both of these things keep growing and then they slow down. When they finally stop growing, they produce a lot of root hairs. At this point, it leaves what we call a scar, so you can tell where they stopped. And then, as the days go on, a new meristem will be formed in wild type. It has to reorganize itself and then it'll grow away from all of this mess, giving you this growth curve here. Interestingly, if you look at expression of WOX5, which is a QC-specific gene transcript, what you see is that um, as the days proceed after radiation, in wild type, and we haven't looked at SOG yet because we don't have the line yet, WOX5 expression spreads throughout the root tip. So it's as if all of these cells are volunteering for the position of new QC. And when this root tip finally reemerges, you're back to having WOX5 expression only in those four cells. So somehow the QC is selecting among all these potentially crappy cells to find perhaps a really good one that is going to make up the new QC, which is a bit of a stretch, but that's what they seem to be doing. OK, so I should just move on to thank the people responsible for this. So you may have met Phil Conklin. He's moved here to Mike Scanlon Lab just recently. And he and Victor were responsible for a lot of the transcriptomics analysis, but Phil did all the wet lab type experiments. And this is just to thank the rest of my lab who's doing other projects and other things that you can ask me about too. And of course, I'd like to thank the students again for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure so far. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.